Welcome along to another Monday night edition of Play On, the Scottish Football Show. I'm David Simmons and on tonight's show, delighted to be joined by a gentleman who is an absolute legend in the Scottish football scene. We've got Mr Pat Statton on the show. Pat, thanks for coming in, mate. Pleasure. Uh, like I say, legend is a term that gets it's flung about too often, but we are actually joined in the presence of Mr Pat Statton tonight. Superb. Pat, you grew up in the, the Nidri area of Edinburgh. As a youngster, there was no sort of one-to-one coaching that we see today, no 5G artificial pitches. That didn't stop any world-class footballers coming through, though, did it? No, and I think that was that was all they had to, to do at the weekends, you know, to play a game. And sometimes it was twenty a side, you know, for everybody to get a game. The only problem you had was whoever owned the ball. If he had to go home for his tea, he had to take the ball with him. You know, he's under orders for his mother, so he's away with the ball, and you've got forty guys standing on a pitch saying, "What do we do now?" <laughs> My ball, my rules. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> was it Salvi Boys Club as a youngster? Salverson Boys Club, yes. I um, Terrific club. Uh, very lucky with uh, the players that I, I played alongside there. There was two or three of us all in the same team. They all, all came from the Craig Miller area. Uh, and they were all, the rest were all from the, sort of the Grant area, West Pilton, places like that. But uh, they were a good side. Because I remember we won the Scottish Cup, beat Port Glasgow Rangers through there in the final but uh, some terrific players yep I mean after Salvi you moved on to obviously Hibs but in between that you were put out on loan at Bonnie Rig Rose in the junior ranks did that sort of shape you for the player you became to be I think it was one of the best bits of advice I ever got uh, at first I didn't want to go to Bonnie Rig. Um I wanted to be at Easter Road and be there with the players and at the training but the manager Walter Gobray says it'll no do you any harm he says in fact so fact It'll do you a lot of good. He it says it's a, it's a tough league. It'll toughen you up, and he was right about that, you know. But uh, and what happened was the fact the time I was at Bonnerig uh, playing sort of regular, no regular to start with. You've got to play for your game. Um, you, you were just pl- playing away there each Saturday, and you were you were getting toughened up. And that was bit virtually it. Other players should opt to stay at Easter Road and just stick around getting a game every four or five weeks. I'd pass them by simply because I wasn't a better player than them. I was playing every week. Yeah. But uh, that Bonnerig was a it was a great great move for me and there was an old uh, an, old, an old sort of committee member called Mick Murphy and Mick used to always say to me when we were playing when I was playing with the Rose he says uh, one thing Pat he says. You've been a regular in Bonner Rose's team. And he says, that big actor guy. And I'm like, the big actor guy. He says, the big guy from Fountain Bridge. And it suddenly dawned on me who he was talking about. He was talking about Sean Connery. And he says, uh, you were a regular in Bonner Rose's team. He says, Connery, in and out, in and out. Uh, well liked with the players, though. He says, he was really well liked with the players. And I often used to wonder to myself, you know, um, when Sean Connery, you know, moved on to other things and living in the Bahamas or Bermuda, lying at the poolside, wondering what might have been, <laughs> had he got a game for one of those. <laughs> Shattered dreams, but I'm sure he got over that. I think so, mate. I think so. I mean, this obviously comes, we're talking about Bonnery Gross in the junior ranks. I mean, there's now been news that Celtic Colts, Rangers Colts are going to join us a similar standard of league. Do you think that's that's a good thing for the Scottish game? Do you think that'll toughen up the potential up and coming superstars? I think there's, there's uh, I th- they should give it a try. You know, everybody comes up with ideas, but I think. Uh, Going back to the time that I played, you know, like say people like Dave Mackay, John White, Bobby Duncan of the Hibs, people like that, played junior and they said, the junior toughened you up, made you more aware. I think if there's benefits to be had, I think it's worth looking at. Um, and people, well, people maybe go along to watch these up and coming players that maybe maybe are going to Hearts or Celtic or Rangers or whatever, just to see how they're progressing a bit I think it's uh, I don't think you can just close your mind to these things there's other maybe there we won't be one or two drawbacks but I think overall why not try it and see if we can bring the players through because you know for Scotland uh, you know if, if things are not working out for you, you, you they just maybe go and buy a player mm-hmm. so you say to yourself what's the point in having these young kids playing in the reserves if, you, if when a, an opportunity comes 
you're not going to give them the chance. But if you've got one of these lads out playing for uh, Newton Green Star or somewhere like that, uh, who's almost ready, you know, uh, to be given a chance, uh, like I say, give it, a, give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Now back to obviously you're a, a famous Hibs player. Did, was there a, a, a rumour that you could decide for Hearts at that age as well? Uh, was it your uh, mum's your mum's bus fare? Am I right? Oh, in saying? that's right. <laughs> uh, when uh, played at Armiston for Bonnerig one day, yep. and uh, one of the committee came to me at the end of the game, and he said to me, "Says Pat, there's a, says, there's a man want to, would like to speak to you after the game." So I got myself ready quickly. And I went out to see who this man was. And I said, I said to the committee man, where is this guy? And he says, that's him over there. And it was Tommy Walker with the Harps, who was a, had been the Harps uh, manager. I don't know if he was still at the time, but anyway, you know, a man revered at Tyne Castle. And he asked me if I'd like to go and sign for the Harps, you know. <laughs> so I went home that night and my dad's sitting there. Um, Hibs fanatic like all my brothers and he's we're talking about the game and I'm sort of saying I'm saying to myself how am I going to break the news to him I've got hearts wanting me to sign so I said dad you know a guy spoke to me after the game and, I, and he says who was that I said Tommy Walker of the hearts and he went Tommy Walker of the hearts and he wanted you to sign for the hearts I says, ah, but Hibs are taking their time, making their mind up about me. He says, fair enough, he says, right enough, he says, they're at least asking you. And then he looked at me and then he says to me, he says, but what, what do you want to go for hearts for? And I says, well, Hibs are not making much a move. He says, but Hibs, he says, um, you know, Hibs have got a better jersey. <laughs> and all that. You're just talking like a supporter. Yeah. You know, he says, but he says, if, if you want to go to the hearts, you go to the hearts and you do your best for them. He says, a lot of good friends of mine are heart supporters. I says, I well, that's fine then. I've got five brothers, and <laughs> my mother had been in the kitchen, and she, my mother come through from the kitchen, and she says, uh, I've been listening to the two of you talking there about this thing, about the Tommy Walker. And I said, to her, you know, my dad says, ah. She says, well, something that you've not mentioned that's really important. And my dad looked at her, you know, and he, he says, what's, what's that important? He's got to consider it. She says, well, like I say, Monday morning getting your bus fares for your mother to go to their work, my brothers. She says, you know, it's cheaper on a bus to Easter Road for Nidri than it is for Nidri to Tyne Castle. And my dad looked, well, there's common sense there. He says, it's much further to Tyne Castle. It'll cost you more on a bus fare. And he says, See, you've got to consider that the Hibs offer, and I, and I, I think I signed for the Hibs on the, the strength of the fact it didn't cost as much as bus fares to go to Tyne Castle. <laughs> that was true, you know. But, you know, that, just, uh, that was the way they were, you know. But had I gone to Tyne Castle, my dad when I went along to watch me play. Mm-hmm. Do you think that um, interest from Hearts maybe forced Hibs hand in making a move for you? Yes, definitely. They, they were taking their time, you know. Um, and the fact that, like, at that time, I had, like I said, I I'd, I'd moved on. I had uh, I'd, I'd a season with Monarig under my belt. Mm. So I wasn't quite the player had, that was a, who played with Salveson as a juvenile. And that season had toughened me up. And the gap, the gap, if you were, if I'd stayed juvenile or played lower down a bit, the gap between that and senior football was quite big. It's a big gap. Mm. But the fact I spent a season playing it with Monarig against some real tough teams that gap I bridged that gap a wee bit uh, it, you know it toughened me up it made me move things quicker mm. and uh, like I said I think uh, that, that was a what a benefit that was to me yeah I mean you made your debut for Hibs against Motherwell in October 1963 just turning 19 year old do you recall much from that first match I think you maybe scored I scored that yeah. it was a, a raging shot for about three yards <laughs> but it was Things were happen, happening quicker on the pitch. You know, they, they had some good players at, uh, at Motherwell. But uh, to, to, when you look back, uh, to get a chance like that, and they played me, they played me inside forward. You know, inside uh, inside right because I'd finished up in that position with Monarig, but I was never comfortable playing up there. I was more uh, more defensive. You know, playing at the back. Uh, 
but you've been asked to play, so you just play and get on with it. Um, and what changed it all for me was the, the fact that um, when I played with, with Salveston Boys Club, Jock Steen wanted me to go to Dunfermline. And he said that he, he preferred to play me at the back as a double centre half. But when I was when I, I a time when I eventually when I left the Hibs, all these years later on that I left the Hibs to go to Celtic, I was still I still played in midfield. Uh, John Blackley played at the back for the Hibs, a terrific player. Mm. But I could just about get away with it in midfield. But when Steen came to Easter Road, I went back to playing double centre half. Uh, alongside Roddy McDonald and most of my career was spent in midfield and I never considered myself to be a midfield player right. so I guess you could get away with it but I was uh, much more suited maybe just uh, you're facing the ball you know was, was there a certain position you preferred to play was there I preferred to play at the back, the uh, back. maybe it was just uh, you could wander about in the long grass and nobody would notice you you know <laughs> but uh, midfield you've got to stay in the game yep. you know that's the engine and you've got to stay in the game so but no, so it, it, in the end it worked out. No, I could. I mean, you're part of Eddie Turnbull's Tumble Tornadoes as well. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, I mean, what was the bond like in that squad? You had players like Jimmy Arook, obviously Alec Cropley, Brownlee, Blackley, Alan Gordon, um, but just to name a few. What, what was the bond like in that squad? Oh, there was a lot of good players on that side. There were a lot of good players. Um, right back, John Brownlee. Tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Unlucky to break his leg. Mm. Uh, but he was a, a terrific player and we had Eric Shedler the left back really tough uh, Eric uh, you know he just he still in Albion I think Willie McFarlane signed him from still in Albion and he had built Eric up into you know this was a a real a superstar you know but he was just he was a steady player but he made the most of what he had he great fitness very quick and he the thing is, you, you couldn't. He had his, he had his, his strong points, uh, but people to compare him with Brownlee on the other side of the park would be but unfair. Brownlee was, Brownlee could stand comparison with a lot of players, uh, a lot of really great players. Mm. Eric was terrific as well, but uh, we but unfair on Eric to sort of compare him with John because uh, John was outstanding. Mm. Even Alec Ferguson talks about him. Yeah, and we'll come to Sir Alex very shortly as well. There's a, a great story about a 10 bob note. You mentioned your dad giving you advice as well about uh, the strip at Hibs and stuff like that, but there is a great story I came across about a 10 bob note. I mean, do you care to share that with us? Yes, I, um, I remember uh, one of my first nights training at Easter Road, Hugh Shaw was the manager, and after the training, I think it was Eddie Turnbull, and he says, Would you go up the stairs to the boardroom and see the chairman? He wants to have a word with you. So I went up the stairs and uh, he says, how are you, you sure? I says, how are you enjoying it? I said, it's great. He says, you want to keep coming along on Tuesday and Thursday night? I says, oh, God, a guy. And he, he handed me a, a 10 bob note. He says, that'll help you with your expenses. You know, I used to get the bus for you. Nidra's day, well, to Bingham to Easter Road. He says, that'll help you a wee bit with the 10 bob. So... That was that I put it in my pocket and went home and that was my first night and my mother asked me how I got on. I said it was great. Great, you know, Easter Road. I have support I'd been in the, 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 uh, the dressing room at Easter Road. And I handed her it. I says, there's that. She says, what's that? I says, the manager gave me that to help with my bus fares back and forward. Well, she says, that was very good of them, you know. And uh, it was my first money, first professional money and so that was that but years later uh, my dad passed away and uh, my mother and my brothers were up at my mother's and she was sorting through all the bits of that's yours and that's yours and all the old programmes and they were getting what they were doing a watch or whatever you know and then she she handed me this uh, it was like a, just a wee Hibs book you know so and there was photographs and all sorts of things she, he says, she says that's, that's for you so I'm going through the, the, the pages I've taken out of this wee wallet and I've gone through the pages and seen all the photographs and that and then I comes to this 10 bob note and I looked at it you know and, and I knew she was looking over at me and I looked over at her and I says I says you're, 
you're not going to tell me that. Is that the same ten bob? No, I gave you all these, you know. And she says, aye. I says, but there must have been many a night or day you could have done with that ten bob note. She says, no. She says, that's what he meant to him. She says, there was. And Nidri, you know, Thursday night was a, it was a famine night on Thursday because we didn't get paid till a Friday. Mm. And uh, I've still got it. Wow. I've still got it. And you know, I've said it before, you know, if somebody broke into my house and stole anything that was of value football wise, you'd be disappointed. But I'd be re- I'd re- really disappointed if that 10 bob note was stolen. I really would. That would mm. get me down. But no, I've still got it. And I, there's some the odd time I look at it, you know, but... Uh, Fantastic. It's great. Ah, it really I love is. that story. Yeah. Love that. Uh, we're going to go back to Turnbull's Tornadoes. I mean, that side that brought much deserved silverware Easter Road and a 2-1 League Cup win against Celtic. What do you recall of that occasion? Oh, we, we had been to Hamden before and had a hard time. You know, at the end of the day, you, you, you go into a cup final. If you don't turn up, you don't turn up. I mean, a lot of players play other days and never get into a cup final. Mm. So it's a bit... Players should just relax and... Enjoy it, but that that game, uh, and they had a great side, a real good side, you know. And uh, we managed to win that one, you know. But we, we played really well. That could have been that could have been four or five for the Hibs, um, but we played really well. Two up, we had a couple of minutes to go, and I think Kenny scored for them. And there was a long, long couple of minutes to, to the full time. But uh, the, the, the thing with it, with it, this. I was speaking to Jimmy I wrote before the game and I says, you know, we had uh, we had we had disappointed to have support over the years, you know, going up to uh, going to Hamden and no really doing ourselves justice. And I remember going through in the bus with Jimmy and I says, you know, Jimmy, I says, see if we're ahead and the final whistle goes. In those days, if you went for the cup to get the cup presented to you in the stand, you weren't allowed back on the park again with it because I think there'd been trouble in the past. You know, guys, you know, the team running around, the, the victors running around the park. A lap of honour sort of thing, yeah. And a wee bit of bother. Right. And uh, I says to Jimmy, I says, you know, if we're ahead when the final whistle goes, we'll go over to the supporters before we go and get the cup. And he says, that's a good idea. And when the final whistle went, I looked over at him. Now, Jimmy and I had played in the same school team. Mm-hmm. And we... We went over to the supporters and we got a real kick out of that because it had been raining that day and we had let these people down so much and we went over to them and we got a real kick out of that getting it before we went to get the cup. But it was, that was really good for us, you know, and the boy, the rest of the boys were delighted with that, you know. Yep. Uh, what about the celebrations when you came back through to Leaf? Was there celebrations with the cup? What was that like? Uh, it was, uh, the, 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 it was, you know, Princess Street, the whole shooting match, you know. Um, it was good. Great, but because uh, I, when I went up to the following day, when I went up to my mother's, uh, my dad came through for the bedroom. <laughs> what had happened? When the when when the final whistle went, he was sitting. He was sitting in his chair in the house. He was ready to go up to see the cup, the cup coming back. He had his hat on and his raincoat on, yep. but he had fell asleep in the, the chair. <laughs> And that, that was that, so he didn't manage up. But I think he might, he might have managed up later on in that, but uh, that was that. You know, all these years and he's sitting there sleeping. But uh, oh, she sees he's had a great time, you know. Good. good. Brilliant. I mean, that squad also wrote history as well with emphatic 7-0 win over Hearts in 1973, uh, a result that still gets talked about and used for bragging rights. Um, at the time, did you realise how iconic a game that was going to be, the 7-0 victory against Hearts? Um, no, not really. No, really. You know, it's Tyne Castle, New Year's Day. Uh, you just want to get a result. You know, it's a tough place to go, Tyne Castle, any time. But uh, you know, the goal, the goals came. Hearts had bit, had really a couple of good chances early on, and they just didn't. They think they snapped at them a wee bit and, and missed. You know, mm. and then Hibbs just started to build up a heavy steam. But uh, Hibbs were an outstanding side then, and. Uh, I'll say one thing about them. They, I remember at half time it was like it was five nothing at half time, and uh, one or two of them were saying, you know, this is what you dream about. You're a youngster, New Year's Day, Tyne Castle, five nothing up at half time, and Eddie Turnbull, to his credit, Eddie says, forget about the five. He says, you go, you go out there 
and you, you keep at them. He says, you know, you've got res- they've got respect these guys. You know, they've got their pride. He says, uh, and then you forget that. He says, play as hard again as you have done the first half. We only scored two in the second half, but Eddie was dead right about that. You know, these guys, uh, they were there, but we wanted to make a fool of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean another famous Hibs victory you were part of was the 2-0 victory against Real Madrid uh, there's a great story about a, a minor injury you picked up in that evening wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> I did, you know to be, you know Real Madrid at Easter Road and, you know you had, your photo, they had their photographs on your, your bedroom wall you know Puskas and Hento and Santa Maria and De Stefano and all these you know, was, you know a couple of seasons before that you were standing on the terrace and mm. here you're standing up uh, to play, take on the uh, uh, Real Madrid but uh, yeah I can remember the game I, I saw him I've still got the mark to show you <laughs> uh, went for a tackle with Puskas fabulous player there was no need for him to do what he did but I went in for the tackle I was I was only 18 at the time and he, he, he went over the ball to go over the ball you've got to come in just later mm. let the guy commit himself and then catch him later and he caught me in the ankle and uh, at the end of the game, you know, you're taking your sock off and there's a big red plat patch on your sock. And uh, I remember the, the trainer, Tony McNiven, saying, you know, I says, that was Puskas that did that time. You know, imagine that. And he see, and he, he went away through to the treatment room to get the, the bandages and the, the plaster. And Tom, I says, I'm not one of them. I'm not wearing any plaster on this. Or, and no dress there at all. And he went over and I says, I want to walk up Nids Remains Road and show the guys. You know who did that? <laughs> that was Puskas that did that. <laughs> but he healed up, unfortunately. Well, yeah. I've still got the mark. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and am I right in saying that you're, you're a relative? I think it's a great, great nephew, one of Hibbs's founding fathers, is that right? So green and white's in the blood. <laughs> That's right. Aye, Michael Wheeler. Aye. Uh, my mother and father, they, see, they knew more about it. They, they, my dad, especially, he came from the Cowgate area of the city. Mm. Uh, where sort of the Irish community gathered, you know, the St. Patrick's uh, churches there, uh, but that was where they were, and that, that's where Hibs were founded, and uh, I think they, they started in St. Mary's Street Halls, and uh, that's that's where they started, you know. There you and, go. Uh, so, and he, he, he was one of the sort of people who pushed it along, you know, so we've, we've got a connection there, but my, my dad knew more about it than, uh, than I did, but the, the connection was there, and uh, so, there we go. Yeah, I would, somebody must have done something good. Yeah. <laughs> in 1976, uh, you left Hibs, you transferred to Jockstein Celtic in a swap deal that took Jackie McNamara Senior to Hibs. Do you remember how that whole transfer came about, Pat? Well, I, I wasn't seen eye to eye with Eddie Tumble. Uh, but just, he uh, was playing me in midfield. I was past playing in midfield. I would much prefer to play at the back at that stage. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was other wee things. But uh, I had great admiration for Eddie as a. A coach, a football coach, but there was other things, other parts of the thing. I, I didn't see eye to eye with him, but uh, oh, it's uh, it was okay. It, you know, there was times I could I could maybe see him far enough at times, but you, you, you just you just got to get on with it and keep playing. No, no that's it. I mean, Jockstein obviously rated you. You mentioned earlier that he tried to sign you for Dunfermline when you were at Salve. What what was you like as a gaffer? What sort of manager was Jockstein? Uh, ruthless, you know. I don't think he, I don't think he ever asked you to do anything you couldn't do. You know, I think he knew your strengths, and he uh, left it up to you. You know, but there was times if you maybe didn't do it, you know, play it as well as you could, you could play. You know, everybody has, has off days, but uh, you're sort of terrified of going back up the tunnel to the dressing room. Mm. You know, and he's sitting waiting on you. But uh, oh, no. That move for me at that age, you know, I was in my early 30s. I could have been, done, made that move in my sort of early 20s and no made able to cope with it because there's a lot of pressure on you at Celtic Park, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, the crowd, the, just, they're a massive club, you know. So to go through there at my age at that time, having a bit of experience, that held me, it kept me going, you know, and on top of that, playing, playing along some no bad players, you know. Yeah, no, tell us about some of them. I mean, was it the likes of Doug Leash, McGrain? How did they all make you feel when you came at the changing room? Oh, okay. ah, terrific, you know, terrific Danny, you know, one of the nicest men you could meet. Uh, kick you as good as look at you, though. <laughs> um, Kenny, Kenny's just a great player, just mm. a great player, you know. 
which when you pick balls up at the back and you're looking up the field to play it, he would show just at the last minute, you know, uh, just make himself available. There were one or two others, I've not just the Hibs, but the other teams you played with, you'd be looking for forwards and they maybe go behind the other defenders and so you can't get them. You couldn't accuse the Douglas or anything like that. He showed very strong. Yeah. Very strong to take balls into him and uh, I was lucky there to, at my age, to go there and uh, play with so many good players. Yeah, who else caught your eye when you first went in there? We've mentioned obviously McGrain and Dalgleish. Was there any others that you thought, wow, he's well, different Lennox, class? Lennox was still playing. Right. You know, he had a lot of admiration for him, you know. Um, I remember he's, when he played on the, on the left wing, he was quick. But he would take the ball up to the defender. Uh, and if he kept going, the defender could sort of catch him. But he used to go up hours, not at times, he would go up to the defender and he'd stop. So that means the defender stops and just as the defender stops, he's away again. And he's catching the guy on his back heels. Yeah. You know, and he just, just a good player and uh, a really nice guy, funny guy. He was really, really funny. But uh, all they had their characters, you know. Roy Aiken, same, you know, big cultured individual, you know. Um, but tough. Uh, he could have went in any company and get away with it, you know. He could have went up to Morningside and played the piano for all the locals up there you know but uh, uh, he was a good player a lot of good players in that team yeah I mean do you remember the first time that you, you made the return back to Easter Road after signing for Celtic <laughs> oh yes it's, uh, I felt a lot of pressure I really did I didn't I didn't want to get beat mm. I didn't want to get beat and we had, I think we got I think we drew that night I think I could be wrong I could be wrong about that one but the first game back and then the other one uh, to go back to play uh, to win the league mm. to think that all your years spent at Easter Road uh, as a player to be sitting in the opposition dressing room picking up a a league medal it, it was pretty good I'll tell you it was pretty good <laughs> and uh, the, the, the fans were good to me the fans were good to me uh, if I was being honest about it one or two of the directors weren't that keen but then I wasn't keen on them either, you know. It's fair enough. It's because when I when I left, all the time I was spent at Easter Road. Uh, when I left to go to Celtic, which is a great move for a player, a player of my age to mm-hmm. go there. There was one or two, I would say more than one or two, never even phoned me up and wished me all the best. And there was guys that were there five minutes, and they were this, that, and the next thing. And you say to yourself, "Is, is that is." that's it hey, all these years and that's how you behave you know I told my dad well, I had my dad he, he was he was, <laughs> he was really annoyed but it didn't surprise me about some of them you know yeah they were I felt just you know they, they, they were honest about what they, they just they just didn't they but uh, and you got other people you know like say <laughs> when we, we won the when we won the cup as well Jimmy O'Rourke phoned me up you know so I'd won the, the, the league, the cup, and the league cup, you know. So anyway, and he says to me, he phoned me up this night, and uh, he came on the phone, and he says, uh, I said, what is it you're after? And he went, you've won the three of them, good, and put the phone down. <laughs> and that's, he found the time to phone me and wish me, he'd say, great, delighted at what I'd done. Uh, because Jimmy was my roommate over the years at yeah. Easter Road. But I was very disappointed uh, that, that that stuck with me that you know and uh, football's a hard game it doesn't need to be that hard though you've got to be have a bit uh, gentlemanship maybe I, I think Aye. so but to, to think that the fact that I would say even the, the, the chairman did me didn't wish me all the best with that and the rest of the directors didn't they do either you felt you felt say, can you not be men and stand up for yourselves mm. and they're people that sat and watched you and uh, very disappointing that you know but uh but the fans, the fans gave you fans the words. Fans were terrific, Go absolutely on. terrific. You know, they, they were great and were delighted. I even, even half supporters would stop you mm. and say, "Well done, that was great." Maybe a bit late in the day, but it was great. Uh, that was uh, that's the one that stuck me. You know, left a bit of sour taste in the mouth. And when in uh, any time I bumped, well bumped in, I just ignored them. Mm. Uh, how petty can you be 
vindictive. I really, I re- really annoyed me that. Yeah. You know? I mean, your it's time. A, it's a tough game, but it doesn't need to be that tough. No, exactly, exactly. I, mean, I think that's the same in, in any sort of line of work, like you say. Not just a football club. You've got to have that that gentlemanship. Thanks for your time. All the best in the future, sort of thing, isn't it? That's right. Absolutely. That's right. I mean, your time at Celtic, like we said, it's seen you lift further silverware and com- complete your domestic set. I mean, all round happy memories at your time at Celtic, Pat. That was great. That was great. I was, like I say, I was, I'm, a, I'm a hip supporter. And mm. to, to go through there and uh, I can remember the the, the, the game where we clinched the league, we clinched it at Tannadice. Mm. And uh, we had parked our cars this side of the bridge to get picked up when they came through from Glasgow to go up to Dundee. And then we won. We, won, we, we got the result up there, which meant we'd won the championship, you know. Mm. So. I'm getting dropped off coming over the bridge and you still paid there, we still the booth there, so <laughs> we just came through and my car was parked up and uh, getting off the bus and uh, just just the bus the, 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 the bus door had opened and I'm just gotta get off and walk up to get my car and Steen says to me, he says, Well uh, what did you think of that the day? I says, Terrific, terrific. He says, uh, where are you waiting tonight? I says, what do you mean? He says, are you waiting to see all your hips, pals? I says, probably am. He says, well, that's what you are, son. He says, you're, you're a hip supporter. I says, you're only getting us a wee hand now, you know. <laughs> and there I was, you know, but uh, that was, that was to me, you know, for, like I say, a player of my age, to go to a club as big as that and play with players, the terrific players that were there, and to be treated like that, you know, mm-hmm. Um it's really good yep I mean we've talked about Hibs we've talked about Celtic you also won 16 caps for Scotland between 1966 and 74 um, were you captain the side three times as well that must have been a, a huge honour to represent the country never mind captain them as well oh, mate. God, yeah, I think you, you, your first cap you know the minute you get your first cap when you you know and you look back to when you were playing football and playing in the public park with your pals on a Sunday morning um, and you think of these magnify that the, the, the whole place everybody played football and on that particular day you get picked for your country and then later you know to get picked as captain as well you know it's that's no bad that uh-huh. it really is to think of all the people that play football and for one reason I just maybe just didn't go any much further in it but st- still enjoy the game and then it goes junior and senior the whole then international it was a uh, it's pretty good that really yeah. now like you say I mean you're one of the one to eleven best players in the country at that time and captain who who were you sort of up against for a place in that Scotland squad who was trying to push you for that position oh the people when I was playing there yeah, you had people like uh, had, had me playing in midfield like I say I was preferred but, but you're playing uh, Bobby Bobby Murdoch yeah. uh, Billy Bremner <laughs> John Gregg George Graham, wow. you know, all these, so you were in good company, you know. But uh, and I got on well with him, you know. I, uh, I used to, I remember when we used to go to Largs, I used to play golf with Billy Bremner, and Billy was a dominant character, you know. In a group, he was a dominant. So it, it was, and I used to go golfing with him simply because we, we used to bring up the rear simply because we weren't very good at the game. <laughs> but out in the golf course, well, it was terrific, absolutely terrific, terrific to listen to, talk to. Really, really good lad. But like I say, he was uh, in a group. He, he was a sort of keep the surface, and he was a great player. He really was. Yeah, absolutely. You know. What did you enjoy more? There was a one you had. Uh, did you enjoy going away in the international duty, or did you prefer staying home with the club? Or oh, going away with the international. But it's just like I say, you, you get asked to go. Uh, it's, it's just terrific, you know. When you first get, you know, you first. Yeah. You, and you know you might go you might go in the squad the, the first uh, wee while and you maybe not get a game but then you eventually you get a game but uh, you just go out and try your best and uh, you find too a lot of them are a big help to you you know the players you know just relax and enjoy it you know mm-hmm. uh, yeah I mean it was a knee injury that, that forced you to call time on your playing career uh, what was that time like in your life Pat when you knew it was it was time to call it a day on the playing side yeah it was just uh Pre-season, pre-season game at, it was against Dundee United at Celtic Park uh, I think we had been in Australia uh, on tour uh, that was a great trip as well but uh, 
I just felt it was a ball got played past me, and I just felt as I turned, I felt my knee just. It's hard to describe. It was just a, a wee bit of stiffness, and I tried to carry on. I couldn't carry on, and I had to. I came off. Uh, I, I tried. I went out to try the second half, but it didn't. It wasn't going to work. And uh, it was a cartilage, you know. Uh, but uh, when I was in the hospital, I caught hepatitis, you know. Right. So I wasn't in and out, you know. And I was getting on a bit as well. It was just wear and tear. So that was that. But uh, I had no complaints, you know. When you look back, I was very lucky playing with the teams I did. Players were the players, the players I played alongside. And then you remember other players early on in their careers who picked up injuries mm-hmm. and didn't quite get over it. And so you say to yourself, I've been lucky. I've been lucky. So, yeah. So. I mean, after after your playing career, you moved into management and one of your first gigs was to be assistant to Sir Alex Ferguson at Aberdeen. How did you find the, the transition from playing the game to sort of in the dugout coaching now? I think you, at times you have to bite your lip a bit, you know. If they, if they were about to do something silly, <laughs> you used to say to yourself, how, how did they not see that? And it's just, just experience, you know. They, they, some players will see it right away, and other players maybe it takes them a bit longer to see it. Uh, you just make them aware of it when you. And you what you what you've got to watch, I think too as well. And I think Alec was good at that. I'd never tell them what it was like when you played, you know. Then they harp a bit in the past, or or bring up players that you played with, you know. That just players get a bit annoyed at that. But yeah. oh, I think. Great time up there, and still, still speak to him. Uh, what was he like as a person back then? Did you know he was destined for the top back then? Uh, he was, he, he, yeah. I would, I would have said that he, he got to the right club, and I think he, he you know, the Man United. You know, I think uh, he knew which which club would be the right one for him. But uh, oh, he's uh, he had a good sense of humour. You know, maybe people didn't realise that. He yeah. had a terrific sense of humour. Um, he was a well-read person as well. He, you know, he read books and that. You know, yep. I think he was quite friendly with Jimmy Reid, the uh, Upper Clyde shipbuilders. You know, the, the strike. Aye. And but uh, all right, he, had, he was <laughs> terrific memory. Abs- quite an amazing thing. I remember somebody when I was at Petardi, they were talking. They'd been talking about something, and he somebody brought up a subject. He mentioned somebody, and right away he had it. You know, and. It was like that all the time, you know. Just um, amazing memory, but away, you know, away from the football, good company. Yeah. Uh, I used to go off with him sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I got on well with him, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you mentioned his sense of humour. I mean, I, I come across a story about uh, Bulgarian coat hangers. <laughs> uh, Is there any truth in that? Well. <laughs> Still the book. Oh, ah, I know. I'm all over there, oh, dear, oh, dear. You know, now he's, he's, he was sort of packing his bag and he went into the cupboard and he's bringing out these coat hangers and he's putting them in a bag. And you know, I says to him, "What are you doing?" I says, "And I thought, but you can you can buy them in Aberdeen. <laughs> you know, you can buy them in Union Street. You didn't have to buy them for here. You know." But uh, no, he was just. That was him, you know, but uh, dead serious, you know, just, ah, oh, but uh, like I say, it surprised maybe some people that he, good company, good laugh, mm-hmm. uh, but then, uh, you know, when business takes over, he goes back to what it is, you know, but, and I, I felt as well with him, he, he was loyal to his players, right. you know, uh, and I think the players knew that as well. Maybe they maybe didn't understand it, but he was, uh, yeah. I would I would say that, Bill. Loyal, he was loyal. You know, you've got to have the if, if if you've not got the players on your side, yeah. you're, you've got to have problems. Don't stand that. a chance, yeah. yeah. I mean, you also had managerial stints at Cowden and Beath and Dunfermline. How was how was your time at these clubs? Great, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Terrific people, full of enthusiasm for their club. Uh, Really good, but great, you know. Somebody told me, I don't know if this is true, was it yourself that found Norrie McCarthy? Yes, Norrie McCarthy. You remember the first time you seen him play? Yes, he was playing, playing for a, a whiskey a whiskey company. It was Leith, Leith, uh, Dunne Leith Docks. Right. It was a a whiskey place that he worked in, you know, and uh, 
No, he was. It was funny. He was a, a, a mate, a, a guy that lived next door to me in in Nidre. Uh, a guy called Martin Murphy, big hip supporter, and he says, uh, "There's a chap what's beside me in the whiskey bond, you know, in Leith." He says, "Terrific player," and I says, "What age is he?" Which is really, really wrong. It's he says he's about eighteen, and I thought, well, if he's no showing be eighteen, mm. you know, which is that's wrong to me because you know some players come up yeah. late. He says, "I," uh, he says, you, what, "You fancy having a look at him?" And I. Martin was a friend of mine, so I didn't know why he said, no, I'm not interested. Uh, I said, I will go. And we went up to these public pitches up by, by, by Nidre and the team. And, and the, the level wasn't too bad, but he looked a good player. You know, he, and you just, you're saying to yourself, I wonder here. <clears throat> and uh, signed him for Crown Base. And he was really good, you know, really good. But then one night I got a phone call uh, for Dunfermline and uh, they were asking me about him, you know. And I says, uh, oh, he's, he's, he's a good player, you know. And uh, no, I'd gone to, I'd gone to uh, Dunfermline. That was the thing. Right. I'd gone to Dunfermline. And then I got a phone call about a player that they were interested in. And I said to them, I said, he says, we've not got any money. I says, I know that. I says, he says, would you be interested in Norrie McCarthy? I couldn't believe my ears. And I, I went, I'll need to think about this. You know, Can I phone you back? Clean hardball. And I put the, the, the phone down. And we had big George Stewart was with me. And I said, George says to me, what was that? I says, are interested in Ori McCarthy. And, uh, and George says, what did you say? I said, I want you to think about it, you know. So I went back to him, I says, um, okay. I says, not too sure about this one. I says, but uh, okay. We'll send a laddie over to you and you send Ori to us and we'll get the papers all done. And that's how it was done. Great player for, they've got a stand name after yep. Ori. Mm-hmm. But uh, oh, I, you know, playing, pl- you know, working in a whiskey bond and lease, uh, but and then getting a chance like that, but he took the chance, you know. Yep. Aye. You mentioned that off air. It's about being in the the sort of right place at the right time and taking your chance, isn't it? Yes. Aye. You get you get opportunities, and the last thing you say is, well, I'm, you know, you've got to leave it open, you know. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you burn your boats and say, no, I'm. I'm looking for something different. I'm looking, I mean, I know what he got, but mm-hmm. you know, you've got to start somewhere. But uh, he was an amazing signing, you know. But uh, unfortunately, yeah. passed away early. Though that was, was tragic, know. wasn't it? Aye, but uh, <laughs> the one thing about Norrie, if you maybe you, you were having words with Norrie after the game, where he maybe didn't play all that well, and he was felt, you know, t- tremendous physique. And he just used to smile at you. Did that annoy you more, or did it? <laughs> I, it wasn't so much annoying. When I look back, it was a narrow escape. Right. <laughs> he just smiled at you, but he knew that he, he was taking it and taking it on board. You know, and you didn't need to tell him too much what he did. You know, he, he'd been handed an opportunity and he took it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, aye, it was aye, not even Cathy. <laughs> and we should have. I don't think anybody paid me Martin Murphy anything as a, a finder's fee, you know. Uh, uh, but Martin, every time I saw Martin in the uh, later years, he says, I pulled down that, that one out of the hat for you, didn't I? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Superb. I mean, you returned to Easter Road as well this time as manager. Um, was there a bit of sense of pride in returning back to your home club? Yeah, I, th- I felt at the time, you know, the way things were there, I, 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 I got the feeling, no, this is no. I don't, even, I don't think this is for me. But being a hip supporter, uh, the whole thing, you feel if you didn't take it, you wouldn't get asked again, you know. Uh, so I took it, but I, I must say I enjoyed it. It's, I was lucky when I went there, you had Mike Namara and Callaghan and all these guys, you know, um, Eric Shadler, you know. The nucleus had a really good side and uh, they, they played well, you know, the 100%. But uh, 
but lucky to have these players, you know, you'd have struggled with the likes of the McNamara's and the Callaghan's and all these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we got Willie Irvin, this from Motherwell, I think. We got Willie, could score the goals, but yeah, it was, uh, it was hard, it was difficult because you couldn't, any, if you looked at a player, there was nothing you could do about it. You couldn't sign them and people would come along and maybe sign your player. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Nah, look at looking back, I, I enjoyed that. But like I say, you, you, deep down you were saying to yourself, man, it's no always a clever idea to retrace your steps, um, but you do it anyway. Yeah. You know? uh, You've got that loyalty to the club when the call comes, you take it, don't that's you? Right. Like I say, it might never come again, you know. But uh, and then it got to a stage where nah, you say them. <laughs> I've had enough. Had enough. Had Call it a day. Aye, yes. we, we, we've obviously discussed your, your playing career at Hibs, it's in Scotland, at Celtic as well. Do you think things could have been different if at Salvi Boys Club you'd signed for Dunfermline when when he was after you at the start? Maybe, yeah, maybe. But uh, I, I think he, I think he deep down he, he knew that. You know that uh, Hibs suddenly got a, a spot on. You know. Mm-hmm. And everything happens for a reason, Pat. So there was a reason why you never signed at Dunfermline. <laughs> well, the thing is, my, my dad was a big influence. He really was, you know. And uh, and it eventually Steen caught up with me, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. my dad wanted me to go to East Road, you know. And uh, I was a hip supporter as well. But like I say, hips were, hips were taking their time. Uh, they had you on a provisional forum and they were... My mother actually, uh, what happened was my mother went through, she f- phoned the, the SFA or whatever at Park Gardens and, you know, if you've been, if you've signed as a provisional, it's got to be registered with it. Mm-hmm. She phoned up and asked and they didn't have, my mother says, wait a minute, is, am I getting a funny feeling about this? She says, you've not registered them, have you? Which was, what they had done was, Hibs had sort of instead of doing that, getting them the necessary paperwork, held back, held it back just in case you didn't quite make it. Mm-hmm. And then if you weren't starting to show good form, they would pr- produce it, which was out, that was out of order. But not. Eh? And uh, my, my, I can I tell you, my dad was raging about that because I remember the, the Hibs scout came up to the the door, mm-hmm. uh, big white jagger at the bottom of the stair usually it was a big white jagger with a blue lamp on it you know <laughs> but uh, the, the hip scout came in and sat there and he talking about you know we, we're loyal and my dad said loyal I said you've not been loyal to him he says he signed that in good faith and what did you do he says you never registered his, his forums lying in a drawer at Easter Road and he says you, you kept that to yourself and the guy says, well, uh, well that, that's, that's what happens. I said, but doesn't it make it right, my dad says. My dad says, you know, it's time you were gone. He says, uh, he'll, he, the guy says, what's he got to do? He says, he's got to think about it. He says, he doesn't owe you anything. He says, he, he says I'm a hip supporter. Said, oh, what is a hip supporter? I didn't like what you did there. He says, um, and he'll take his time to think about it, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, just as he, the guy was sitting there, he was about to say something to my mother, and my, to my dad, and my mother wandered through and she says, I think you better leave. <laughs> and he got up and he left. Eh? Wow. But then uh, Walter Gilbreath and the whole thing came up, you know, but my dad and my whole I mean, the boy mentioned the word loyalty, you know, my dad. That's it, I'm off. He's been loyal to you, but you've no other way around. He's just a laddie, you know. Yeah. But... Uh, Oh, no. That's all under the carpet now, Pat, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it, was the team, it was a team you wanted to play for. Yeah. You know? yeah but it just unfortunately, like I said earlier on, you know, when I left the Hibs to go to the Celtic, there was one or two characters there who uh, I, I wouldn't say hello to, you know, after it. Yeah. Um, and I mean directors at the club who didn't have the nerve or the gumption to stand up and be counted. You see, you're so... Cheerio. Mm, exactly. Now, on the 7th of September 2019, obviously pre COVID, at the Usher Hall in Edinburgh, there was an evening with Pat Stanton. How was that occasion for you, mate? That was great. 
that was terrific, you know. It's the, the, the Usher Hall, you know, and all these people turning up, and the, just the whole night, you know. Uh, you know, Willie, uh, Willie McEwen and Paul Kane and others uh, put on it. It was a great show. It really was. It tremendous. When they first spoke about it, I thought, where, where did you get to hold that? You know, and Usher Hall, but uh, they, they got that, but. Uh, and it was for people like Stevie Archibald and all these other lads who have cropped up over your career and then Fergie to come up, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> you know, it, just, it was great, great, you know. Like so Alec and I go back a long time because we, we used to go to the coaching courses at Largs way back when Roy Small had the, the, the coaching uh, things down there at Largs. Uh, Alec and I would go for a couple of pints, didn't I? And into Largs, and uh, since, ever since then, got on well with him. Times I played against him, I could have seen him far enough, <laughs> you know. But uh, he was a good player. He was a good player as well. And then, uh, then he disappeared down in England. I don't know what he did down there, but that was. Uh, <laughs> did you ever keep in touch with him during that time? I still, I still speak to him, you know. And, no. uh, and I, I, I didn't phone him too much, you know, uh, but just for him for. Yeah, time to time, you know. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it's funny as well, you know. He'll, any time I phone him, he'll he'll there'll be a pause, and he'll say, "How is it?" He says, "You never phone me just to say hello. Every time you phone me, you're wanting something like that's your hall." <laughs> he says, "You're always wanting something." He says, "Well, come on, let's get on with it." And uh, I says, "You're a busy man." I says you were you had that team you had that team for a while you did all right with them you know and uh, he says I don't know I says but I says I'm not going to phone you and bother you with talk trivia to you I says uh, no I says uh, I'll phone you when I when I he says I'm only kidding you on you know <laughs> but like I say that well, like I could still speak to him now and still get a Christmas card of him brilliant there's no stamp on the envelope but that's another matter you know. <laughs> <laughs> Need to pick up the post office and pay the fee. <laughs> aye, the government post office. Aye, aye, you pay for it. Aye. <laughs> Final question for you, Pat. I ask a few football players that I speak to, um, and I might put you on the spot here slightly, so there's no rush to answer it. But if you could go back now, looking at your playing career, and you could play one 90 minute game of football all over again, what game would you choose and why? Oh, I think. I think the night that we played Napoli at East Road and Dino's off was in goals for Naples and uh, we beat them 5 nothing. I felt that night Hibs could have played anybody mm-hmm. uh, I don't know what Dino's thoughts on it are <laughs> but uh, that was a great and it was an um, a big crowd and it just fell into place you know we had played well over there we played really well uh, when the game got started we, we, did, we didn't score right away but Bobby Duncan who I mentioned earlier on uh, Bobby right back the left winger did they ch- Bobby got possession and the left winger did they chase him to get the ball back and Bobby was sort of in their half an hour half and suddenly he was into their half and he hit this one for, I don't know, it was well out, and he just screamed into the net. And then, you know, suddenly, it's, uh, I think the scoreline score for the first game was 4-1 to them. Right. So suddenly it was 4-2, and they were within touching distance. Had it been a trundler, it wouldn't have lifted the place, but the fact it was such a, what a goal it was. You know, and again, Dino's off. Suddenly, oh, oh, could something be on here tonight? And we, we beat them 5 nothing. And I see Bobby for time to time. Bobby lives not far from me, you know. And uh, it's funny how it's getting further out every year, that goal. <laughs> I'm sure it's 55 yards the last time I spoke. <laughs> Superb. What an absolute pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Pat Stanton. <laughs>